Okay, let's look at number three. So number three is kind of a funny one um, because this is uh, both the simplest question and the one that I'm probably going to take the longest on uh, just to give a little bit of background. Uh, so question number three is, what does the common abbreviation DX stand for? We have a couple of examples here, double expansion, direct exit, double expulsion, direct expansion. Um, I kind of like some of those. I like direct exit. That's kind of a nice one. Uh, double expulsion sounds like maybe a good uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme film or something. Like I think it has some real possibilities, but it's not a, not a potential answer for us. Uh, direct expansion is what DX stands for. So uh, let's uh, let's back up for a second and talk about what this what we're really talking about here. Okay, for HVAC systems in big commercial structures. The way that you generally, the easiest way to sort of imagine this is to think of it as four loops. So if you think about, there's one loop, the one uh, kind of uh, uh, right in the middle there with the two little boxes at the top and the bottom. Uh, the one loop is the refrigerant loop. So what's the refrigerant loop doing? Think about it, it's one set of material going through one set of pipes and it's on one side and then it's on the other side. And then it goes back to the other first side and it goes back to the second side. So it's one loop. The only thing that's changing is we're changing the pressure of the refrigerant in that system. So we have a compressor and we have an expander. And if you think about that for a second, you probably already understand that when we use a compressor, so it's the same material, nothing else has changed. All we've done is change the pressure and we've made it much more, uh, much higher pressure the temperature of that material goes up because there's a direct relationship between pressure and temperature of any one given material. The reason we use refrigerants is because they happen to be really useful. Uh, they, the temperatures that this all works at are incredibly useful. Uh, they just work out to be temperatures that are uh, very helpful. Uh, so other materials will do the same thing. They just don't do it in, in ways that are as easy for us to manipulate. So the refrigerant, the whole point of the refrigerant is that it does this at this really easy uh, set of uh, temperatures. So we have this loop, we compress the refrigerant, it gets very, very hot because it's all very dense and tight. Think of yourselves like going into like, uh, you have a hundred people and you go into a small room, you know, you're gonna get really hot, right? It's that density, right? It's gonna make everybody really hot. Then you take that same hundred people and you go into a much, much larger room, everybody cools down, right? Everything gets sort of cool and easy. So we compress it, the refrigerant gets very hot. We then uh, let it go over to the expander. And like one of those little spray things you use, spray air things that you use to clean off your computer keys, right? You ever do that, right? When you spray it off, it gets really cold. Well, the same thing is happening in, in the expander, in the refrigerant. We let it uh, uh, free from its uh, intense pressure, and now it cools way down. So the only thing that's changed is the pressure on the refrigerant. But that has changed the temperature of that refrigerant. This was a kind of useful and key sort of understanding of how we can start thinking about air conditioning because heating is relatively straightforward. You burn something, it gets hot, you take that heat and you blow it around, move it around some way, right? But air conditioning is really tricky because you can't just make cool, right? Start thinking about it for a second. It's like, how would I make cooling? Well, the way that I make cooling is by removing heat. So I'm actually moving heat around when we talk about air conditioning, uh, uh, cooling systems. So because this refrigerant has this ability with this, within this one single loop, I now have one side of the loop that I can then relate that refrigerant to, say, a big barrel of water. And that hot side of the refrigerant is going to be in that big barrel of water, and it's going to make that barrel of water hot. It's going to give a bunch of its heat to the water. Well, I can then take that water and take it somewhere else and expel that heat. Maybe a cooling tower on a roof, maybe somewhere out back, something like there's some way that I'm going to be able to take that heat and move it somewhere else and expel it out to the, to the world, out to the sky. The other side, I have a barrel of water, but it's cool on the other side. So essentially what I'm doing is because the refrigerant is cooler than the water on the cooling side, it's accepting the heat 
from that water into the refrigerant. So that when that refrigerant on the cool side is accepting that heat, it then goes to the compressor, it gets hot, it gives that heat that it just accepted to the water on the hot side. I can then expel that heat. So effectively what I've done is I've moved heat from the pool of water on the cool side. I've taken heat from there and I've moved it over to the water on the hot side and I can get rid of it. So I have a heat rejection loop going off to the one side, going off to the one side. Uh, and I have a chilled water loop going off to the other side. So I've essentially, by pulling the heat out of the water, I've made the water chilled. I've chilled the water because I've removed the heat, some of it, some percentage of it. So the refrigerant loop is right in the middle of that. I have the heat rejection loop on the, on the one side, so going backwards here, uh, and the chilled water loop on the other side. And then I can take that chilled water and I can take it anywhere in the building. Right, water is very easy to move around. I have pipes. It's uh, it's expensive to do the pipes, right? It's not a cheap process, but it's very easy. It's very small. I can move a lot of uh, temperature around quickly and easily. Uh, so I can place that water anywhere in the building, and then I have the fourth loop, which is the air side loop. So I have an air handling unit somewhere. I may have many of them. I might have one on every floor. I might have one every. 2,000 square feet, I might have one every, like however you're lining up the building, I'm gonna have at least one uh, air side loop. So I have the air loop that is taking the cold water, the chilled water, using that in my coil and blowing air across it. And then that air that we blow across it becomes the supply air, goes into the supply duct, moves out into the space, goes through the, tr the branches of the supply ducts, goes into the actual space where the people are occupying it, uh, it gets used, uh, breathed in and lived in and all of that, eventually finds its way back into the return system, comes back to the, to the air handling unit, gets reconditioned and blows out again. So that's a whole internal by itself loop, that air loop, blowing air out and we're letting it return back. There's a few little complications of bringing some outside air and some other stuff, but essentially that's one sort of standalone loop. So I have four loops to make this system work. Almost all air conditioning systems are based on this basic idea. It's all based on this idea of the refrigerant loop. There's a few examples where that's not true, maybe five, eight percent or something of the, of the examples out there, but almost all of the examples you'll run across will be based on this basic idea. The sort of one caveat there is you don't always have all four loops. So, I'm going to look at one example. Actually, I'm going to look at two examples, but we're going to look at one example first. So this is a little kind of wacky sketch of uh, a kind of classic example. So if you think of this uh, down at the bottom there, I have the chiller, right? You've probably heard of the term the chiller. Uh, the chiller essentially is I have a refrigerant loop and I have a barrel of water on one side and a barrel of water on the other side. So I have a hot side and I have a cool side, the chilled side. So I have that uh, uh, compressor and I have the uh, expander and it compresses the refrigerant and makes it hot. I give that heat to the hot barrel. It makes it, the water hotter. I then take that water, in this case, up to a cooling tower up on the roof. That's what that little thing on the side there is representing. So the water goes up. In this particular case, the water goes up and sprays down and through evaporative cooling and through just kind of the sheer nature of spraying water, you'll get rid of a lot of the heat from that water out to the environment. I then recollect that water, it goes back down into the uh, barrel uh, to be heated up again by the hot refrigerant. The other side, I'm creating the chilled water loop. I have the chilled water on the other side. I make this big loop. I take that loop anywhere in the building. I put it in front of the fan and the air handling unit. Uh, I can then condition that air for the air side loop. So you've got all four loops represented in this. This is kind of a classic sort of, you know, uh, it's a 1950s building. Yeah, that's what it looks like right there, right? I've got the chiller in the basement. I've got the uh, cooling tower on the roof. Those things last forever. Uh, they're pretty efficient and very flexible because I can always change the pipes around and change the whole systems. The air systems are located wherever they need to be and not where they don't need to be. So that's a classic 
sort of basic system shows all four, all four loops in, in action. But then let's look at one other example. All right, this would be a DX example. So this is direct expansion. What this is saying is this is a rooftop unit. Again, kind of a crappy little sketch, but you get the idea, I hope. Uh, this is a rooftop unit. There's lots of different DX versions, but what this one does is there is no chilled water loop. So this one is saying we're going straight from the refrigerant when we make the cool side of the refrigerant, instead of making cool water and then taking that wherever we need to go, we just take the refrigerant and put that in the coil right in front of the fan coil, the, uh, the air handling units, the fan coil unit. So the refrigerant itself is actually interacting through the coil with the fan. So it's direct, it's a direct expansion. Uh, if you think of the term direct, it's probably the easiest way. It's direct from the refrigerant to the air side loop. We skip the chilled water loop altogether. Uh, there are certain advantages to this and there are certain disadvantages to this. This particular example where I have a rooftop unit, uh, this is a classic example for kind of multi-tenant buildings. Um, maybe I have a three-story loft building that we're putting in a bunch of different uh, tenants in, and who knows how long they're going to be there, right? They're going to be there three years. They're going to be there six years. They're going to be like, it's not, you're not doing the uh, headquarters for General Motors or something uh, or Google or something like that, right? It's sort of, it's a, there's a transient aspect to it. Well, this is sort of a perfect little system, right? Because I can take this straight off the shelf. It's a whole system all in one box. Take a crane, I put it up on the roof. Uh, the whole thing is there. It's got the heat rejection system uh, going straight from the refrigerant uh, into the heat rejection. It's got the coil with the refrigerant uh, and the fan, co the, the, the fan with the coil uh, creating its own air handling unit uh, right there up on the roof. The only thing I need is to have a duct that leaves from that system and goes down through the roof into the space that I'm trying to uh, heat or cool. Uh, so it's a very simple system that I can easily put up on the roof, direct expansion, no chilled water. That's all it's referring to. This is one example of this. And just since I brought this one example up, uh, think about why this would be a great system and why it would be a terrible system. So while you're thinking about that, would you like to live on the roof? Uh, probably not, right? Uh, depending on where you live, uh, it's got to deal with snow, sleet, rain, uh, UV rays, sun, right? So this system, compared to that chiller in the basement that was built in the 50s, uh, this system is going to be replaced every 10 years, every 12 years, something like that. It's going to have a very limited lifespan because it's just a terrible place to be uh, up on the roof. You get all the worst of everything. But if that's appropriate to the type of tenants that you have, if that kind of turnover makes sense, then that's fine. The other big problem with this as a system is the way to make this work is I put a giant hole in my roof, right? So I have to get the air from that box down into the building. So instead of using those nice small water pipes with the chilled water in them moving around the building, I'm actually moving around with these huge big ducts and it takes up square footage, I have big holes in the roof. I have all these things that are sort of problematic, right? With leaks and all those kinds of problems. Uh, so the right system for the right project. Uh, DX tends to be these kind of uh, um, uh, are more typically used for uh, uh, projects that are more transient. I think it's probably the best way to say that. So that uh, things are going to move in and out, that's probably going to be a sort of logical choice. Other systems that are more like kind of institutional or something like that are probably going to be more associated with like chilled water systems, chillers, where they have much longer lifespans, more centralized uh, control over these pieces. If you imagine I have these uh, rooftop DX units, I'm going to have to place a whole bunch of them up on the roof to deal with all the different tenant spaces. Uh, so everything's decentralized, which means the maintenance is decentralized, which means, you know, all of those kinds of things, which makes sense if I have individual tenants. It doesn't make so much sense if it's, say, a college campus or something where it would make sense to have that be as centralized as possible.
right? So the right system for the right job, simple answer, D, direct expansion, for loops, all of that stuff is just to give you a little bit of uh, background for how to think about that. And did you and Alma look at the uh, same bulk answers? Or the, um, the one person from the same? Yeah, so we, we did get uh, uh, a very brave Megan uh, sent in uh, her, her answers to the, to the exam. And sure enough, Megan got it right. Uh, direct expansion uh, for, for number three. Uh, she got a couple, uh, a few right, few wrong. We'll go through a few of those uh, as we go along. Thanks, Megan. Today's ARE Live episode is an extension of our online ARE curriculum that you can find on blackspectacles.com, the home of online learning for architecture and design. If you need to prepare for the ARE, which I assume many of you guys do, and if you're looking for a good way to study for the exam that's more flexible and easier to digest than the traditional exam prep materials, then head over to blackspectacles.com to try out any of our free ARE video tutorials that are taught by tonight's presenter, Mike Newman. As an attendee, and as you can see here on the screen here, we have a couple of notes or information for today's episode. Any Anyone who is attending today's session, you're eligible to use this coupon code worth 15% off the first charge on your individual membership. If you're one of those folks who would like for your firm to purchase Black Spectacles access for you and your colleagues, just visit blackspectacles.com business, which is this fourth link here, and we'll send all the information for your firm to get set up. And also from now until the 15th of next month, firm memberships are 15% off if you mention this episode when you submit your form through blackspectacles.com business. Also on this, you'll see that our next webinar will be on May 27th with Mike at six o'clock. So if you'd like to register for it, here's the registration link. We're still firming up the details and the actual topic. So if you have any suggestions and would like Mike to cover a specific topic or would like us to interview someone in particular about a specific topic, please let us know. 